Hi. Whoa, that's loud. Can you hear me okay? I'm Emily. I'm from EY. I work for our global healthcare team. Uh, our global leader of health is an Englishman called David Roberts. Fortunately, he couldn't be here today. But we and a small group of people, we work across the world with different organizations, helping them with their technology agenda. Um, so we're out at the cold face with many different markets around the world that are dealing with these same issues. And I'm here today to report back on a few things. So the topic is the journey from the legacy to the postmodern EHR. And I want to start by looking at some of these macro trends that are happening to the fundamental way that we're delivering healthcare. And this is for a confluence of reasons. Globalization, the increase in obesity, aging population, the rise of consumerism, new entrants into the market, so the disruption of our sector with retailers and technology companies and internet service providers, and the landscape has really changed even in the last one to two years. And that is putting pressure on the way that our service model works. So what we're seeing from a perspective of the point of care is we're seeing it move from the hospital to the home. Now, some areas are doing this better than others. If we look at Denmark, 20 years ago they had 98 hospitals. Today they have 32. But even in areas that are continuing to build more hospitals and, and more buildings, it's very common to see hospitals have uh, care in the home programs because they know that this model of uh, acute care is not working that well. Um, from a data ownership perspective, we're seeing it move from institutions into the hands of the patient from a few different angles. Um, one, because as patients, we're actually just generating more of our own data right now on my wrist, um, with devices in my home, but also from a legislative perspective, healthcare systems are mandating that even that institutional data belongs to the patient now as well. From a reference point, the population to the individual. Now, years ago, the effort was all about reducing variation in care and channeling, channeling it into standard care pathways, right? But now it's going back to variation. But intelligent variation, complete personalized care based on physiological aspects, like your new antigen response or your genome, but also your personal preferences, how you want to be treated and, and what health and wellness actually means to you. The doctor's role is moving from an authority to more of a guide, and that is based on the intelligent consumer that's armed with more information than they've ever been before. And the way that we analyze data is changing as well. It's gone from buckets of data, all siloed, because our systems don't talk to one another, moving towards the ability to gain big data insights because data is being brought more together, more easily. Now, these are not all being felt equally. I'm sure many provider organizations out in the NHS look out and all they can see are emergency departments that are overflowing and wait lists that are getting longer and not enough bandwidth to redesign the way they deliver care because they're just trying to keep the lights on. And that is because there's a ceiling to these trends that is very much tied to the technology architecture that enable them. So without the right kind of architecture, we actually can't realize the potential of this new wave in healthcare and, and the direction that it's going in. And hospitals are really far behind, particularly when we compare ourselves to other industries and the way that those industries are connecting their patients with their service, their consumers, their customers with their services. And so the question becomes, how do we create technology that collects and organizes and intelligently uses all of this data? I want to talk for a moment on the concept of the participatory health ecosystem. It's very simple. It just puts the patient, the consumer, at the center of the architecture and the infrastructure. In the blue bubbles, you can see providers and payers, and the yellow are all of the enabling technologies. It's a very simple concept. But the reality of today and the reality that we continue to try and build actually puts the acute institutions at the middle as we know. And, and we're at odds because what we do know is that consumers will drive their own health and wellness agenda. And we know that because we can look around the world and we can start to see some very real examples. If we look at Asia Pacific and virtual care providers like Ping An, Tencent, 
They're providing tens of millions of virtual consults every week. Medical grade devices, we can buy them now. We can buy an ECG that sits on our wrist. We know that technology companies are in a race to bring out the first medical grade blood sugar reader on the smartphone and a broader blood screen after that. We know that there are 27 billion connected devices, and in five years, there'll probably be about 75 billion, probably more. And most importantly, we know that of all of the data that indicates whether you'll stay well, whether you'll get sick, and what to do when you get sick, only 20% of that sits in the hospital system. 80% sits with the patient. They're generating it themselves, or it's just about them. It's their socioeconomic status, it's their choices, it's their behavior. So given that, how do we build the architecture to actually capture this? How do hospitals figure out how to get this data so that they can use it and understand how to actually contribute to the consumer's own health and wellness agenda? Now, this diagram wraps up some of the concepts I've just been talking about and puts forward somewhat of a technical architecture. I just want you to take a look at it for a second because at a glance, it probably looks futuristic and something that somebody that works for a consulting firm would have come up with. Got convergence and data fusion. What does that even mean? Well, I want to challenge you for a moment because hospitals have always felt that they are the center of attention when it comes to healthcare data. But they're not, and they might never have been, and they certainly won't be into the future. We just spoke about how only 20% of that data that's important to your health and wellness sits in the hospital sector. So when we look at the concept of the personal health cloud, that already exists. Even though Apple and Google famously came out with their health cloud and it failed, the new health cloud already exists in our pockets. We might not even want this data to be collected, but it is collected, 80% of it. And more and more so it will be. And we as consumers need that to be in a secure platform. So that's why the importance of the personal health cloud is here already and will continue to be so. Um, the convergence zone here. So when we think about the different technologies that are contributing to that information, to that 80% of information that dictates our health and wellness that sits with the, the people, with the consumers, this is the 400,000 health apps that sit in the App Store already. Tens of thousands come out every year. And they're moving, what we see, is they're moving from applications and technologies that are mostly about health and wellness and information to technologies that are more about treatment and curation. And they can do this because of those medical grade devices, because of the intelligent consumer, and because of the structured way that we're starting to orchestrate care in the home. And so in this environment, where more and more data is becoming curative and, and about treatment, less of that data sits in the hospital. So it's, it's squeezing even more. And this data fusion zone, I mean, conceptually, that's really just about how the different types of data collected from different sources comes together to provide new insights, more relevant insights, to both the patient and the care providers. So this is Alexa helping you track your blood sugar. This is your Apple iWatch telling you that you might have some cardiac pathology based on your signs. This is health insurance companies building well-being apps that use all the data in your phone just based on permissions. They don't host any of the data, they don't even really access it, they just use it with your permission to give you insights. The reality is, this already exists, except it exists outside the healthcare system right now. And it's going to continue to grow. And so what the healthcare system needs to do is figure out how do they fit into this? How do they collect the data? And how do they contribute their data? Because even though it's only 20% of overall the data that does matter, it's important information. It's scientifically validated information, and it will continue to be so. We just need to figure out how to support this architecture. So let's talk about why EHRs and the current architecture isn't, isn't actually fitting into that at the moment. So we know, and you've probably heard about all of this already today, we know that the traditional EHR systems create a documentation burden for the providers there. Physician burnout is well documented. 
We know that the competitive landscape of the EHR market means that there's proprietary data models that deliberately lock in data so that it can't easily be integrated with other sources. We know that the architecture of these systems are quite old, and they actually don't accept newer types of data, for instance, from wearables, um, from other medical devices, and even just the amount of data. To use all of that and to run analytics over that slows these systems down. They, they can't cope with it. Um, the way that they've been built, which is really just to be a repository of data and a billing system based on the American way of providing healthcare, it doesn't leave any room for patients to meaningfully interact with their own care. There might be a patient portal, but it's not that participatory health concept. It's very much about the provider and the provider documenting. Um, the concept of the EHR being a mega suite, this is something that's happened over the last five to ten years, is actually a lot of the componentry that sits in the EHR doesn't belong there and, and never did. They've taken what the ERP is providing, and they did that because the ERP market was kind of lagging about 10 years ago. But now it's back, and with S4 HANA and Salesforce, the ERP, ERP market is well ahead of the EHR market. They're moving to the cloud at a faster rate. They've got more modular solutions, and actually what we will start to see is functionality from the EHR going back to the ERP. So, we know that the EHR right now is a mega suite, that it's clunky, but we know that it doesn't need to be that big. And because of all of that, we've seen a poor return on investment from EHRs, billions and billions of dollars, just to create a data repository that's also a billing system. So let me just look at my notes for a second. All of that said, there are still many organizations that are choosing to go down the traditional route. And we know that this will be the last cohort that will adopt this technology. It's already a legacy technology. The EHRs that you buy today, the traditional ones, they're not going to be what we use in the future. There are organizations, though, and there are whole healthcare systems that are choosing a different route. You might have heard about some this morning. I had a brilliant chat about what Norway is doing most of their regions heading towards the open EHR route. New Zealand has come out with their national health information platform strategy. They ditched their national EHR strategy. Their plan is to leapfrog. Um, so it is starting to happen. But what, what is that new technology? What, what is it? What's the postmodern EHR? In our view, the postmodern EHR is not a giant mega suite. It is a collection of technologies oriented around the consumer, largely cloud-based, and extremely flexible. Easy, right? <laughs> Maybe not so easy. And the crux of it is that it isn't just up to a single hospital, necessarily. That one hospital's architecture is part of the bigger picture, and it requires more of a teaming across the whole market to execute on this. And and a few different success factors to consider as well. And so I want to leave you and actually have a discussion and some questions at the end about what some of these immediate steps might be towards that postmodern EHR and that concept. And the first thing is about the skill set of the people leading the charge. So do you have the right leaders in place? You need a different kind of CIO and CTO to deliver on this vision. You need someone who understands the landscape really well, understands how healthcare is changing and how the different players in the ecosystem are influencing that. You need people that are bold and brave to take a different route than what the market is dictating. And when a sector goes through this kind of disruption, it creates a skills gap because it needs a different architecture than it has needed before. But actually, that skill gap might not be as big as you think, because a lot of the answer to this, if we think about moving to the cloud um, and moving to anything as a service, a lot of this can be outsourced. You just need someone who can create a technology architecture that will support the new way of doing things. So do you have the right leadership? And this is a, is a difficult question, but you need the right person to lead the way. You need to shrink the core of the EHI you already have. So if you have already gone down the route 
of the traditional EHR and you're fully digitized, then your strategy becomes about how do I shrink that core functionality, um, moving things to the ERP maybe if that's where it sits, or moving functionality across to an open platform. That might be how it looks. But over time, you need to shrink that core so that you can have the functionality on an, an open platform so that the data can actually be used. And that's the next point. It's key that the data is actually separated from the application layer. The traditional EMR vendors don't do that at all. Um, you need to adopt a bimodal operating model, so a way of running your business that keeps the lights on and keeps optimizing and keeps improving the way that you're doing things currently, and a completely separate operating model for the new innovation, for the new way of working and the new technology architecture that you need. You can't have one team that is trying to do both because they will constantly prioritize the burning platform, the password that needs to be reset, the upgrade that needs to happen. You need a bi-model IT operating model. Now, this is a big one. We need to stop being at the mercy of the big vendors. Um, and, and this is a tricky one because we talk to a lot of CIOs and CTOs that are looking to either implement their first generation EMR or replace it with their second generation EMR. And they look at the market and they think, well, but our procurement team, they want us to purchase something that has all of these reference sites where it's been implemented before, implemented in a country. There's all of these things that we have to abide by. And we're worried that if we actually put out into the market what we want, that no one will respond to our tender and we won't have anything. So actually, we need to write it in a way that we know that the, the vendors will at least respond to. But, but you don't need to do that. And so we've been coaching some of these teams, some of these CIOs, to actually just write what you want. If you want an open system, if you want a system that's extensible to an open platform, put it in the requirements and see what the market comes back with. Take control. Um, and to extend that, this requires collaborating with your peers to seed the market and to encourage the market and encourage the incumbents that are already there and the new um, entrants that are providing innovative functionality. When we think about back to 2008, when the legislation in the US came out that seeded the, the EHR market in the first instance, it was really just about digitization. Organizations were penalized for not being digitized, and they were rewarded for being digitized. The way that the market was seeded was to just buy something and put it in. And so we need to be more intelligent about how we encourage this market for the new wave. OK. And so that is all I have. And I've left you here with a quote. But I wanted to open it up for any questions or comments um, and discussion about this concept and how it ties into some of the things that were talked about this morning. Oh. So, questions. That was fascinating. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that was a fantastic job, Emily. And, um, you know, you're you're clearly thought leading message here. My question is, what's the single biggest blocker you've found when you've gone out there? Is it the state players, the people who represent government and national bodies not getting this or not doing the right thing? Or is it the market players that are making life difficult? Mm. It depends on which market you're talking about. There are some markets that um, were early movers in the EHR space, so they're you know, they're just trying to sweat their assets. They don't have any money to, to change their investment. Um, it's, it, there's a lot of fatigue in the market about change. There's a lot of frustration. And so for them, it is really just about um, creating enough space and enough capital and enough time to make the case for change. In other markets where it's more greenfield and they perhaps haven't gone down the big traditional digitization journey, it's about uh, needing a reference site, needing something at scale that shows them an alternative. And there are lots of great examples where there's been different ways of doing it. Estonia, for instance, Slovenia. But a lot of the healthcare systems we talk to feel like that's not 
relevant to them because the population is small or because the healthcare system operates differently and they, you know, their personal career is on the line if they make the wrong decision, so they're going to go with something that they know has been implemented in their own country. So I think, depending on where you are, it's different, but it is getting to that point of, uh, of momentum where you can kind of see so many examples in front of you that you can follow. Um, and I think we are almost there. There have been some really exciting things that have happened even in the last year. I don't know if there's any of... I mean, there's obviously... Um, representatives, people from different countries across the world, in Europe. Any, any of you got any stories from the Netherlands or Finland or Norway or anywhere else about how that shapes up in your world in terms of that question? You know, what are the blockers? Anybody feel brave? Thanks, Martin. <laughs> I'm Martin from the Netherlands. Uh, if I hear your story and I see that, uh, or I hear that the data inside the hospitals, they are getting less and less important because everything is moving to the cloud. Um, if you look from a different perspective, that the people go to the hospital to really be cured. In the home situation, you have the data, but maybe it's not so important to be cured. How do you, how do you think about that? Sorry, can you just start, say the last so if, thing if you have if you go to the hospital, you need to be cured. So the data is maybe more important than the data in your personal health record. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that is about scientific validation, about the, you know, whether the, the data that's being generated is of medical grade. And at the moment, it's very, that's very much happens in the hospital. But the trend that we're seeing is that the devices that support that are also being generated for the consumer. So there's medical grade ECGs now that you can wear on your wrist. There's other medical grade devices that are being um, developed. There's FDA approved virtual reality allied health consults. So you can um, buy a headset, virtual reality headset, and have physiotherapy care in your home, and that's FDA approved. Um, so I think at the moment you're, you're right, and that I think is why, back to the first slide I talked about, the movement from the hospital to the home hasn't been felt universally yet because we're still waiting for that s capacity for truly validated information to be available in the home. It is just around the corner, though. And there will always be a place for very high acuity care in the hospital, but that's the reason why we need to, to move most of the care out of the hospital to create the resources to treat those really sick people that need intensive care. Another question? Yes. If you, look to, if you look to the personal health uh, cloud itself, and you see all the vendors uh, having different solutions in their own proprietary database, maybe. How do you see that? Because you have to have a, a standardization on that healthcare cloud platform also mm -hmm. to get all the data and collect it in a central way. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the vendors will move to that kind of situation? Yes. This is a question that I don't think has been answered yet. Um, I'm going to go back to this slide. This kind of very conceptual slide here. And there's this notion of the global aggregator, and that's the idea of, of someone coming in and creating really the architecture that supports all of this. And that isn't, that isn't in place yet, and if we look at the technology companies that are out there, the best place would probably be an Apple or an Amazon. People, I mean, they already own most of our data anyway. Um, but they need to execute on that. And when you look at the acquisitions, um, the earnings calls, uh, a lot of data about what these companies are doing, we know that they're making huge investments in healthcare. And we know that this kind of aggregation platform exists in other service industries. It just hasn't hit healthcare yet. So I believe that the vendors will move in that direction. Uh, and it will be difficult because there will be lots of concerns about privacy and data moving across borders. and how quickly regulations evolve and how risky it is to take that, that on. But I think it, it'll happen. Sheref? I could done it from you. Um, this is slightly related to um, your, one of your previous comments. And you're on the exact slide, actually, that I wanted to talk about. One of the problems small companies have 
if they're working on AI or um, anything related to decision making. Mm. And um, you, you, very interesting, you mentioned that uh, there are now many applications working on, you know, just um, basically curation and prognosis. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, that is extremely strictly validated, mm. especially in the States. So if you write a piece of software that almost always goes under the category of a medical device, which goes through a very expensive mm -hmm. process of getting approval. So you can, you can get a device that you can put on your wrist, but if you want to write some sort of application that's going to suggest something based mm -hmm. on that data, then that application across the globe um, goes through a process. So mm -hmm. do you know um, if the process of getting that kind of approval is easier, say, in Asia or China or other places compared to US or Europe? Yes. Okay. It's much easier in Asia than yes. it is in both Europe and the US. I mean, Europe and the US are equally challenging for different reasons. They've got yeah. different things to consider. I mean, the US has the Patriot Act, for instance, which means that any other country doesn't want their data to go anywhere near there. Yeah. Uh, Europe has GDPR. Um, you raise a good point. And before you even get to the, the problem of regulation, as a small company developing these kinds of technologies, your first problem is getting access to the quantity of data to train these algorithms and mach machine learning yeah. models. So there is, I mean, um, my, my point was kind of that assuming that problem is solved. Mm, okay. Because this is what most of the vendors in this room work on, mm. and I, I work for one of those vendors. Um, would you would you suggest that uh, is it the situation that would you connect the let's say um, practicality of going through that process um, you know just being related to is is it basically do you have more smart prognosis and clinical decision support related applications across Asia because of that would you would you correlate those two facts or would you <laughs> no comment on that. No, I would I'd correlate it in a particular way. I would say that um, I don't have a whole lot of data, but this is, this is more of a theoretical answer. I would say that small companies are going to have success in Asia, reach scale, and then move into Europe and the US. And then companies that are bigger and have the capital to go through that process, and we're starting to do that too. I mean, we're, we're developing curative technologies. Um, and we can just throw money at it. And so we can start in Europe and the US and then move into Asia. Um, so I think it'll happen in both ways. Uh, and one thing that can provide success is partnering with the right organizations, ones that are not directly competitive to you but can unlock the thing that you don't have. So EY, we partner with small companies that have the idea and the people and the capability, and we can open doors in terms of regulatory, access to data, to train, that kind of thing. So it becomes, you're welcome. Take one more question, thanks. Yeah, I feel I have to oppose your logic. <laughs> <Yes>. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that the center of like gravity of the medical data dossier file is moving from the hospital to the uh, the patient itself. That's what you're saying, right? Or did I misunderstand? I'm saying that of all the data that indicates your health and wellness and likely likelihood to get sick. Yeah. Uh, does not sit in the hospital sector. So if you looked at all the data, 80% of it sits outside of the hospital, and that 20% is specific and it's important and it's scientifically validated, but it's a small piece of the puzzle. That's what the argument is. Okay, that's a bit more nuanced than I, uh, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I want to tell you a bit about the Dutch situa situation because you say what we, what's happening is that only like, the really sick patients stay in the hospital in the future. But this is actually what we've been doing it, uh, in the Netherlands for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a surgery resident uh, for the, the past year. And my main job was getting people out of the hospital. If they were able to walk to the toilet and breathe uh, independently, then they <laughs> should go home, was like the basic, basic rule. And it's been like that for over 10 years. And next to this, in Holland, we have by law regulated that the general practitioner should keep the patient file and like keep a, a full copy uh, of this. But still, the hospital is uh, the mainly the one who has the most data 
about the about the patient and also uh, like in um, like a cultural perspective is by way the, the most important partner in this um, yeah this data patient file so yeah mm -hmm. it doesn't con uh, doesn't correspond to the Dutch situation uh, I'm afraid uh, I can see that I think that the the factor here is that of all of the data that sits out of the hospital, a lot of it, it just isn't being used for anything. I mean, I like to check how many steps I've taken in a day, but apart from that, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't go anywhere. And so, yeah. As a doctor, I don't care how many steps you take on a day. <laughs> <laughs> maybe but, I should, but currently but I But maybe don't. you should, and, mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll just make one more point, is that if we wait until people are really, really sick and walking into the hospital, then that's, that's where the problem is. That's where the unsustainable costs come from. And so if we do take care in this larger data set that is you know, not as acute, perhaps more benign, then the purpose would be to bend the demand curve and keep people healthier for longer. So that's the purpose. Tom, if you don't, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna stop us there because we're just, we're just gonna keep tight for time. We're gonna have a panel session at the end. So maybe if you could, Thomas, if you could ask the question then, we'll bring in. Thanks, Emily, guys. thank you so much. You're welcome.